here. So there's going to be a gap in the recording here. You can check the morning class for the missing parts. But um, this is an HX. X is some generic anion, so it could be chloride, whatever. H2X, H3X, depending on if you have a 1 minus, 2 minus, or 3 minus anion. Uh, this is called a monoprotic acid, diprotic acid, triprotic acid, uh, depending on how many H pluses we have. And H plus is often called a proton. A proton. You know why they call H plus a proton? Yeah, it's positive. But if we look at H1, what's this composition of H11? How many protons do we have? One proton. How many neutrons do we have? Zero neutrons, actually, because the mass number is one the same. And how many electrons? One electron. This is it. If we look at um, H plus, H11 plus, um, what happened? Well, it's got a positive charge now, which means it lost an electron. So electron and so what are, we, what are we left with? A single proton. That's it. Just one proton. Now, well, I was talking about charge density earlier. And so let's take a look at some charge densities here. Let's compare it. Let's say this is sodium ion. Sodium ion is positive. So let's compare it to um, potassium, which is also positive. So sodium ion and potassium ion have the same charge, except potassium is bigger. So which one do you think is more? Um, reactive? The sodium ion or the potassium ion? Well, it depends on what, what I mean by reactive. I mean reactive in the Coulombic sense. Which one's going to be hit more strongly uh, attracted to negative? If you're a negative charge, which one would you be more attracted to? If you're a negative charge, you'd be more attracted to sodium. Why? Because it's, it's more concentrated. The positive charge is more concentrated. And then um, if we go from uh, sodium to lithium, which one would you be more attracted to? Lithium. Lithium still has, lithium has three protons. It has three electrons normally, but it lost one electron. So this lithium ion would have um, three protons and two electrons, which gives it a net positive charge. But when we go to hydrogen ion, hydrogen ion is special because uh, hydrogen ion would be like, like that. It would be like that because how big is a proton? You know, in other words, how big is a nucleus? All we're left with is the nucleus of the atom. At least with lithium, we still have the atom because there are two electrons occupying empty space around the nucleus. And so it's kind of big, the ion's kind of big. But when we go to a hydrogen ion, a hydrogen ion is like incredibly small. Incredibly small. Because we know that nuclei, you know, the nucleus, is a lot smaller than the atom. How big is the nucleus? In other words, how many times smaller is the nucleus compared to the atom? So for example, if the atom were a football field, in size, how big would the nucleus be? Half of it? More than half? So about 50, if, the, if, if an atom is 100 yards, then the nucleus would be about 50 plus yards? 75 yards? Did I mention this? Anybody remember? The, the half is a little bit overestimating. Hmm? 
Yes, it was really small. How small? It's 10,000 times smaller. A nucleus is 10,000 times smaller. So that means that if the atom were like a football field, the nucleus would be like a centimeter. A little tiny dot. And so this would be like a football field here. And then the proton would be like a centimeter. You know, tiny, tiny little dot. Which means, as far as charge density, all of these have the exact same charge, but they don't all have the same charge density. Mm -hmm. So is it mass that the nucleus takes up most Well, all these, the nucleus is going to take up all the mass, but I'm talking about size, okay. the radius, the radius of the um, radius of it. And so it's actually, this is going to be very dense as well. Um, but as far as Coulomb's law goes, um, Coulomb's law is going to be primarily concerned with the charge density. Because all these have equal charge, the difference is the, how concentrated the charge is. And so the most concentrated charge would be in the H, H plus. Highly concentrated, which means it's much more reactive towards anions. Let me, give you a, let me give you an example um, here of how we can use Coulomb's law. Um, uh, do, you, do you know what milk of magnesia is? Milk of magnesia? It's like an antacid. You know, it's a base. And what bases can do is they can neutralize some of your stomach acid, let's say. So you take, it's magnesium hydroxide. You know, so what, what, what it can do is it can just form some water and some salt, you know, neutralize your stomach acid. So uh, this milk of magnesia, so some people drink this stuff. I have in the past, uh, it tastes awful, so I, I prefer not to drink this stuff. It's like pasty. But what happens, you know, you have an upset stomach and you ran out of milk of magnesia. There's no more milk of magnesia in the medicine cabinet. But under the sink, you have drain cleaner. And you notice, you read the ingredients on the drain cleaner. And the drain cleaner is lye, which is sodium hydroxide. So, is it okay? I'm going to um, substitute drain cleaner instead of milk because they're both bases. They're both hydroxides. In fact, I maybe sodium hydroxide. What is it? A little less reactive because at least milk magnesia has two hydroxides for every magnesium. Sodium hydroxide only has one hydroxide, so maybe magne magnesium hydroxide this is going to be more powerful, more powerful because it has more hydroxide. True or false? So would you substitute drain cleaner for milk and magnesia? Why or why or why not? If you say no, why? Is that just because of some bias? Not not founded in scientific fact? Just because I called it drain cleaner? Maybe I'll, I'll call it like milk and magnesia light versus milk and magnesia strong. <laughs> then it might be okay. <laughs> No, um, because we know, we know that um, sodium hydroxide is what we call a strong base. Magnesium hydroxide is what we call a weak base. Why is magnesium hydroxide a weak base? Because it's not soluble. When you drink milk and magnesia, you're drinking a paste of crystals, magnesium hydroxide crystals. And it's going to taste all pasty because it doesn't dissolve in water. Or, you know, a little bit will dissolve in water, but mo for the most part, it's a solid. You know, so this is a weak base. This is a strong base. Of course, you're not going to substitute a strong base for a weak base. You know, and then and this, this, is a, a, uh, this is going to dissolve. And when this dissolves, what forms? Sodium ions and hydroxide ions. Hydroxide ions, not only can they neutralize acids, 
But hydroxide ions can dissolve fats. And so this is why this is used as drain cleaner, because if there's fats that are clogging your drain, then the hydroxide, the hydroxide ions will attack the fat and dissolve them. In fact, that's how they make soap. You make soap by, um, of, um, you make soap by taking fat and mixing it with potassium hydroxide, not sodium hydroxide usually, or sodium hydroxide, it doesn't really matter. Sodium hydroxide or potassium hydroxide. Convert the fat into soap. It, uh, magnesium hydroxide wouldn't work as well cleaning your drain. So if you ran out of drain cleaner, you might grab a, bo a bottle of milk and magnesium, but it's not gonna be as effective. Why? Because it doesn't really dissolve very well. And so, so you could drink this stuff, but you wouldn't wanna drink this stuff because this stuff will kill you. And why, if you look at the bottle of why it has this symbol on it. Whereas if your milk magnesia had that symbol, I wouldn't be touching it, probably. That, does that make sense? That has to do with what? This is like kind of like Coulomb's law. I mean, why is this not soluble and this is soluble? Well, because one reason is because the charge, this is a two plus. If you look at the least soluble, the most soluble species on the soluble rules would be group one and ammonium. The least soluble would be phosphate. What's the charge on phosphate? Three minus, carbonate, two minus, chromate, two minus. And so the charge, charge is gonna have an impact on this. Rust, what is rust? Is, is rust really soluble? No, rust is not soluble. Iron is three plus, oxide is two minus. It's a very strong lattice. It doesn't wash away rust. Okay, so you know, hydroxide is what they use to clean the drains. Well, let me give you another example here. There's something called um, EDTA. EDTA is a pretty big um, organic anion. EDTA is short for ethylene diamine tetraacetato, which has this um, structure like this. There's some other carbon there, I missed it. You don't have to draw this structure, it's not necessary. But when you got a big ion like this, this is actually a four minus ion. Um, there's a negative charge on each of the ends of this ion here. Negative one, negative one, negative one, negative one. And so all together it's EDTA4 minus. EDTA4 minus, you know what ions this loves? EDTA loves heavy metal ions like lead, two, mercury. It loves those. But it also, it, EDTA loves all like that. Uh, yeah all um, cations, even sodium. Calcium, EDTA loves calcium. The higher the charge, the better. The smaller the size, the better. It turns out that um, EDTA, since it likes uh, heavy metal, especially heavy metal cations, they use this as a drug for treating heavy metal, um, heavy metal uh, poisoning. So uh, if these are two drugs, which one do you think is a more aggressive drug or do you think they're the same? Which one do you think is a more aggressive drug? If these are two drain cleaners, which one is the more aggressive drain cleaner? If these are two drain cleaners, the more aggressive drain cleaner would be sodium hydroxide. 
If these are two antacids, which one would you give? The milder one or the more aggressive? Well, I guess it depends on how upset your stomach is, right? Yeah. I don't think you'd give the more aggressive one. Right. It's too aggressive. Sometimes it's too aggressive. Too aggressive. Well, which one of these two do you think is a more aggressive drug? The sodium or the, ED, the calcium EDTA? Is it called the sodium EDTA? This is just called, this is called sodium EDTA. This one's called calcium EDTA. Which one do you think is more aggressive? The sodium EDTA or the calcium EDTA? First one, sodium EDTA. Why? Uh, yeah, dissociate more easily, freeing up the EDTA, right? So, which one would be like drain cleaner, and which one would be like mild antacid? The sodium EDTA would be like drain cleaner, right? Um, these are called chelating agents, so the two common chelating agents here, actually we'll call this Na2, it's actually Na4, we call it Na2 to be short here. We have calcium EDTA, it's actually disodium calcium EDTA, and, and sodium EDTA, which is the tetra sodium EDTA. These are them. They're talking about for use with um, chelating agents, especially those intended for use in children. Um, chelation therapy for children is calcium EDTA. However, hospital formularies usually stock multiple chelating agents. One such agent is sodium EDTA. It's formerly used in the treatment of hypercalcemia. Hyper is too much calcium, but its use has become infrequent. Furthermore, sodium EDTA contains a warning stating the use of this drug in any particular patient is recommended only when the severity of the clinical conditions, condition justifies the aggressive measures associated with this type of therapy. According to the package insert, sodium EDTA is indicated in selected patients for the emergency treatment of hypercalcemia and for the control of ventricular. Right, sir. Yeah. According to the FDA, um, the safety and effectiveness of sodium EPA in pediatric patients has not been established, and its use is not recommended. So this is a little study that they did here. So let's take a look at case one. Case reports, Texas. This is in February 2005, a girl aged two years who was tested for blood lead during routine health surveillance had a capillary BLL blood lead level of 47 micrograms per deciliter. A venous BLL of 48 micrograms per deciliter obtained 12 days later confirmed the elevated BLL. A complete blood count and iron study conducted concurrently revealed low serum iron levels and borderline anemia. On February 28, 2005, the girl was admitted to a local medical center for combined oral and intravenous chelation therapy. The patient's blood electrolytes at admission were within normal limits. Initial medication orders included intravenous sodium EDTA and oral succimer, an agent primarily used for treatment of lead poisoning. The medication order subsequently was corrected by the pediatric resident to intravenous calcium EDTA. At four p.m. on the day of admission, the patient received her first dose of intravenous calcium EDTA. At 4.35 p.m., she was administered 200 milligrams of oral succimer. Her vital signs remained normal throughout the night. At 4 a.m. the next day, a dose of intravenous sodium EDTA instead of calcium EDTA was administered. An hour later, the patient's serum calcium had decreased to 5.2 milligrams per deciliter. Normal value for pediatric patients, 8.5 to 10.5 milligrams per deciliter. At 7.05 a.m., the child's mother noticed that the child was limp and not breathing. Bedside procedures did not restore normal cardiac rhythm, and a cardiac resuscitation code was called at 7.25 a.m. The child had no palpable pulse or audible heartbeat. 
repeat laboratory values for serum drawn at 7.55 a.m. indicated that the serum calcium level was less than 5 milligrams per deciliter despite repeated doses of calcium chloride. All attempts at resuscitation failed and the girl was pronounced dead at 8.12 a.m. So she got in there 4 p.m. and was dead by 8.12 a.m. the next day. It's pretty, pretty depressing. Pennsylvania, August 2005, five-year-old boy. Oregon, August 2003, 53-year-old woman. Just because, you know, some people think hydro it's the same, isn't it? It's the same. No, it's totally different. It's totally different than some. You know, sodium versus potassium. You know, people will just see the EDTA. They go, EDTA is EDTA. And that's what you need. What does that stand for? EDTA? EDTA stands for ethylene diamine tetraacetato. It's all one word. It's a very long word. Ethylene diamine tetraacetato ion. EDTA is used as a food preservative too. EDTA, you know why they use EDTA as a food preservative? Because Bacteria, bacteria need magnesium ions. And so if you add EDTA, the EDTA captures magnesium ions, prevents the bacteria from using magnesium so they can't grow. And so it stops bacterial growth, basically. That's why EDTA is used in a lot of things, food preserve, preservation, chelation therapy. It's still used in chelation therapy. So the CDC, this is a study from the CDC. And so after this, the CDC made a recommendation. Do you know what the recommendation the CDC gave was? Remove sodium EDTA from the shelf. So if there's no sodium EDTA, then, and there's only calcium EDTA, then, uh-huh, there should be no mistake. Well, the sodium EDTA was for like severe emergency acute cases where the calcium level is too high that they're borderline, uh, they're gonna be in big trouble if they don't bring the calcium levels down. And so that's why, yeah. Uh, and so the, what they're gonna do is they're gonna sacrifice any kind of emergency where the, the calcium levels are too high and then, but you know, before they had more choice, but now they're limiting the choices for medication. But it makes sense because, you know, it's easy. Sodium EDTA, calcium EDTA, what's the difference? It doesn't sound so different. It's like sodium hydroxide versus magnesium hydroxide. If I didn't tell you the name, you know, if I didn't call one, they should call one drain cleaner and the other one mild antacid. And then people would know, you know, to stay away. But they don't. They just label it by the... If I didn't call this one... <coughs> drain cleaner, and I didn't call this one milk and magnesia, then the only difference is magnesium hydroxide versus sodium hydroxide. What's the difference? A lot of people don't know. A lot of people would know that one is a strong base, the other is a weak base. A lot of people think that's a strong base, and a lot of people think this is an even stronger base than that. It's wrong. It's not. Huh. Does that have to do with the fact that sodium is not? Yeah, it does. It has to do with the fact that lattice, the magnesium hydroxide lattice is very strong. And so um, it's not easy to break apart it, it, that lattice because the magnesium um, two plus ion. We have magnesium oxide. Magnesium oxide is also a very strong at lattice. You know, oxides, most oxides are insoluble, bearing off that magnesium oxide. Magnesium hydroxide is in here. I have, I have to look it up for that specific one. It might take me a minute since all these other ones are gone. There it is. They have funny ones. They have funny, um, funny structures like this trying to show 
the um, three-dimensional shape. This is the hydroxide ion here. These are the magnesium ions here. So it's a very strong electrostatic attraction between the hydroxide and the magnesium. And then you have this, the lattice, you know, all the lattice does is try to maximize the coulombic attractions. And so the shapes that the lattices adopt are shapes in which you can get the maximum number of positives around a negative and the maximum number of negatives around a positive and as close as possible. Um, that's how they're going to orient them. And so this is, this is not the normal way we look at um, crystal structures. The normal way we look at crystal structures is we have a, a little box called a unit cell. And that little box tells us you know, the building block of the brain of it. But it, it's, because of the, it's because of the charge, you know, and that's why, you know, things like this. Iron 3 hydroxide, uh, you know, I wouldn't worry about this at all uh, as being uh, like drain cleaner. You know, that, that would be a weak base. This would be a weaker base than this, I would think. This would be a weaker base because that lattice is even stronger because this is iron plus 3. This is magnesium plus 2. And so stronger lattice means uh, it doesn't want to react. It's like, I'll finish off one thing before I take, take on a break. You know, uh, it's like barium. Remember the last slide we did, I told you, watch out for barium chloride. Barium chloride, the reason why I said watch out for barium chloride is because barium itself is considered a heavy metal. Um, why is barium considered? Well, all the... All these metals down here are heavy, you know, they're getting heavier and heavier as they go down this way, bearing its way down here. And so, did you know I, I drink, drank this stuff before, barium? I drank it, but it didn't die. If, if I drank barium chloride, um, I'd probably be pretty sick, but I drank barium sulfate, and what, what, I, you know why I drank? I drank it for a CAT scan. I, I, you know what a CAT scan is? A CAT scan, they put you in a machine and then they shine x-rays. Well, all the heavy metals are good at absorbing x-rays, like lead. Lead is great at, lead is a heavy metal, it's great at absorbing x-rays. And so all the heavy metals, so I, I don't want to drink lead and they don't want to give patients lead, so they give them barium instead. But if they gave me barium chloride, it'd be pretty sick but they gave me barium sulfate. So what's the difference between barium sulfate? As barium sulfate, I didn't even notice it. I walked out of there, I felt fine. And so I drank barium sulfate. Well, it's the difference between barium sulfate and barium chloride. Yeah, right. Barium sulfate is insoluble. Barium chloride is soluble. And so that was the difference. And so barium sulfate, it was like a cocktail. It was like drinking milk and magnesia. It was a paste. It was all pasty. It tasted awful. Even though I think it was cherry flavored, but it still tasted awful. It tasted medicine. Okay, so we'll take a break here and uh, stop. <laughs> okay.